Welcome to the Happier and Healthier Podcast. I'm your host, Maria Marlowe, and this is a place where we don't rely on good luck or good genes for our health and happiness, but rather we create it with our thoughts and our actions each and every single day. Each week, I'll bring you a thought or a guest that will help you live your happiest and healthiest life. Are you ready? Welcome back to the Happier and Healthier Podcast. Today's guest is Amy Raup, who's an acupuncturist and an herbalist who's an expert in women's health and wellness. She has a master's degree in traditional oriental medicine and a bachelor's in biology. When she became frustrated by Western medicine's inability to provide answers and unable to find relief, she sought solutions in Eastern medicine. So I'm excited to share her experience and how she came to study traditional oriental medicine. So Amy, thanks for being here. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here, Maria. Thank you. So I'd love for you to explain a little bit more about traditional oriental medicine. So for people who are not familiar with it, what exactly is it and what does it entail? Traditional oriental medicine or traditional Chinese medicine, the the names are used interchangeably, is a medicine and it's, you know, 5,000 or so years old, depending on the oldest extant text that exists. But it's, Eastern medicine. It's rooted in Chinese philosophy and theory or Asian philosophy and theory, even because, you know, different cultures in Asia all practice kind of different forms of traditional Chinese medicine. Acupuncture is one facet of Chinese medicine, as is Chinese herbology, things like Qigong or Tai Chi, right? Those are all encompassed within traditional Chinese medicine. So, I am a practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine. It's, you know, the studies these days in the States, it's about a four-year master's degree program if you also study Chinese herbs. Typically in China, you're either an herbalist or an acupuncturist, one or the other, but you're also rooted in the theories of Chinese medicine. So understanding how nature imposes itself upon us and how everything in our life is a reflection of the nature that surrounds us, you know, living in accordance of the with the Tao, T-A-O, the Tao Te Ching, which is all about, you know, listening to the seasons. And so living within the seasons, kind of eating within the seasons, you know, so sleeping later in the winter and rising earlier in the summer and living in accordance with, you know, the world and our environment, which unfortunately we're quite far from in today's Western highly technological society. So my favorite things about Chinese medicine are, you know, it's different than Western medicine and having been a student of, you know, I was studied biology and was en route to medical school and, you know, very Westernized in my studies. The biggest difference to me is we look at not just the physical manifestations of dis-ease, so discomfort, disharmony. We don't say disease as in like cancer, we say dis-ease, like the body is out of sync, it's out of alignment, right? And so we say, okay, well, how is that physically manifesting? But then also, where are the emotional components to this disease state? So we're looking at, you know, what are the lifestyle components? Like, do they work nights and they sleep during the day? Do they live in like a basement apartment? And how does that impact their chi or their energy state, right? So we're looking at this whole picture of the person and how they interact in their world and how their world interacts with them and how that's impacting their overall health and quality of life. Right. And so there's many different facets of it. There's the acupuncture, there's the herbology, there's the emotional states. Now, you would say that these would all work together, right? We can't just sort of pick and choose one. No, we can't at all. Yeah, they all are feeding off of each other. And maybe one is more dominant, but, or maybe one came first and caused the other one, you know, but we're all about understanding the root of the disease and, you know, not just, we call it root versus branch. So a lot of what Western medicine does is treats the branch, right? So you have eczema, I'm going to give you a cream, you know, and we're going to treat it topically. Chinese medicine, we're like, we have eczema. All right. So what are you, why is your skin erupting? You're you're literally erupting from the inside out. So what's going on? Is that emotional? Is that toxins in your environment? Is that your food? Is it all the above? Unresolved issues, you know, so we go deep and try to fix the root of the problem. And not to say we wouldn't also use a topical herbal ointment to calm the inflammation, but we would still go at it from really peeling back all the layers of the onion. 
Right. And that's why I love traditional Chinese medicine. And I do think it's so effective because it does go after the root cause instead of just trying to slap a Band-Aid on top. Exactly. So I'm curious, how did you get into it, though? Did you grow up? Like, did your parents take you to a traditional Chinese medicine doctor? How did you get to studying it? I mean, when I was growing up, so I was definitely always interested in health and wellness. And I always wanted to be a medical doctor. That's like from a very young age. That's what I always said I wanted to do. And I was always fascinated with biology and the sciences. And, you know, I loved like anatomy and physiology and like dissection in like high school. Like I was totally one of those like real nerds, you know, I loved all that stuff. And my mom owned a gym when I was growing up. So she was really into fitness and health. And I worked at the health food store in town. And, you know, my mom would see an acupuncturist and I kind of thought she was a little crazy. And I had gone, I was a gymnast. So I'd gone to the acupuncturist before for like various injuries. And it was helpful, but I never really paid attention to it. You know, I was really science brainy. And so went through college and then was in graduate school. And I was, you know, studying neuroscience and working in a lab and the guy's the, my mentor, the one who was running the lab, he was, you know, in the medical school and taught there and, you know, tenured uh, professor. And he was really fascinated with Chinese medicine. And he was always like kind of reading books about it. And I think was trying to influence me some because he always would say to me, you know, you have so much compassion and you you care so much about the person and you look at the whole picture. And I, I just don't think this is good. You know, you're, I don't think you're going to be happy when you finish this program. You know, I think you're going to realize like you're just going to prescribe medicine or you're going to sit in the lab all day. And so he was always encouraging me. And he gave me this book called the web that has no weaver. It was by Ted Kapchuk and he's a, an acupuncturist by trade and professor of Chinese medicine, but he also is a research scientist and he teaches up at Harvard and he studies the placebo effect. That's like his main area of expertise. And so he was like melding both the worlds and, you know, there's just a series of coincidences that led me to look into Chinese medicine because I was feeling really frustrated. I was doing research on Alzheimer's disease and basically we're just looking at cells in a Petri dish and and deciding, you know, if they were dying or not, if we put certain proteins in there, right, in the cells with them. I'm sorry, in the dishes with them. And I kept hitting this wall when we would have these group discussions. I would say, well, we're not thinking no bigger picture. Like we're just looking at the brain and there's got to be so many other things that are going on that will lead to this disease development. You know, my grandmother had Alzheimer's, so I was kind of living it. So it was the perfect timing, I think, where I just had so many questions that were so unanswered. You know, it had nothing to do with cells in a petri dish, in my opinion. And I, I guess I was frustrated enough that I sought something that, you know, to see if I could make sense of the way I viewed medicine. And this, I was very holistic, but I had no idea. There was no, nobody was really talking about holistic medicine, at least that I I wasn't on my radar back then. You know, this was like 2002 or something like that. I think I graduated PECOM, Pacific College of Oriental Medicine in 2004. So this is like, it's not even, it's like 96, 97, 98. And one of the guys on my floor, he was a neuropharmacologist, and but he was also a Chinese herbalist from China. And he was teaching herbology at the school down the street, the acupuncture school. And he said to me one day, why don't you come with me? Come and sit in on lecture. Check out the clinic. He's like, it's fascinating. I think you're going to love it. And so I did. And they had an open house. I sat at the open house and it was just so simple. It was like, it was just very simple. And the way they talked about all of these influences coming together to impact our life. It, I don't, it was just one of those moments, you know, I think I was 25 and I just sat there and I was like, this makes sense to me. This is what I need to do. It was just like, it was like clear as day. And that was it. I enrolled in the program and, you know, I continued, I worked for UCSD as a research scientist for a while and studied acupuncture and I never looked back. Well, I'm glad that you made that switch because okay. I, I heard you re- speak recently at the Sakara event where I first met you and you're just so knowledgeable and I really loved what you had to say. So I'm glad that you made the switch and now you can share all your wisdom with us. No, oh, thank you. So I know you work primarily with women and you know a lot about women's reproductive health and fertility. So before we get into the big hot topics, I'm just curious, what do you, are there any trends that you see in terms of women's health? Like, what are we struggling the most with now? And, you know, what are some misconceptions that maybe we have about women's health? I think the biggest misconception we have is that it's separate than any other kind of health. Do you know what I mean? 
I deal a lot with fertility, right? A lot of women trying to get pregnant come and see me and work with me. And the biggest misconception is that fertility has only to do with our reproductive organs, only to do with our ovaries and our uterus. And that's not true at all. It has to do with every single cell in our body and every single cell in our body should be optimally functioning for our fertility to thrive. And one thing I always say is, is your fertility or if I'm dealing with someone with like IBS or anxiety or sleep issues, it's all an extension of health. So the whole picture and health is mental, it's emotional, it's physical, and it's nutritional. So that I think is the biggest misconception that, you know, that women's health just means hormones, right? And that's not the case at all. It means so many more things than just hormones. So, you know, and one trend I see happening, which is, you know, why I wrote my latest book is this epidemic rise in autoimmune conditions. And I came into understanding autoimmunity. I mean, if for those of you that don't know, autoimmunity is when the body begins attacking itself on a cellular level for what we assume to be unknown reasons. And things like Hashimoto's uh, thyroiditis is a very common one. Celiac sprue is a common one. Rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, endometriosis, polycystic ovarian syndrome. So these are all really common type 2 diabetes, autoimmune conditions that exist in our environment. And the trend is that they're affecting women in their prime, so 20s, 30s, and 40s, 75% more than men. And the rise is in epidemic proportions. It's increased 40% over the last 30 years. And it's frightening. And so what I started to see in the clinic was all these women dealing with fertility challenges kind of unexplained, quote unquote, fertility challenges or endometriosis or polycystic ovaries, um, you know, or the syndrome that they were actually dealing with an undiagnosed or mismanaged autoimmune condition. And when I began to treat that from a diet perspective, from an emotional perspective, from a lifestyle perspective, that's when I saw things shift for them. That's when I saw like every health parameter thrive and then their fertility, you know, came right behind it and they got pregnant and stayed pregnant. So I think what's going on right now is um, it's not just our environment and all the toxins in our environment. It's also our lifestyle and our emotional space. And I think women are getting hit a lot harder because of that emotional space, because we're trying to do it all. And we think we need to do it all. We think we think, you know, our peers do it all. Like half of you listening to this probably think someone like me does it all. And I for sure don't. But, and I think we need to dispel those myths. And I think we need to just be really real with ourselves and ask for help. And in all of that, learn to really nourish and support ourselves in the way that our bodies need and desire so that we can thrive. So that's a long-winded answer, but that's my answer. (laughs) I mean, that's so interesting that your belief is that the reason, you know, we know for sure that autoimmune conditions are affecting women way more than men. And your belief is that it's probably because of the emotional piece and women, you know, maybe are more emotional or don't deal with their emotions as well. So, you know, I feel like women, we we tend to put ourselves last, right? We tend to put everyone in front of us. We tend to hold things inside sometimes. So for someone who maybe does feel like, you know, she's trying to do everything, she's trying to please everyone, make everyone happy. How do you start making that shift and start improving your emotional health? I think you have to start to prioritize yourself. I mean, a simple way to do it is if you like to journal or even you want to keep a little you know, an email to yourself, a text message to yourself, or if you use like Evernote, whatever, every day, pay attention to two to three, maybe five ways in which you nourish yourself, in which you put yourself first. For a lot of women, they don't even know what that means. But how can you begin to tune in and reconnect to you know what your needs are, how are your needs getting met versus meeting everyone else's needs, right? So I think we have to slow down. We have to listen to ourselves. We have to talk more kindly to ourselves. And we we just have to be honest. Like, is this making me happy? Does this really stress me out? Am I doing this to please everyone else? Is Like, that was my whole thing with going to medical school. That was a status thing. I just wanted to, you know, I think get approval from my father who would have approved anything I would have done. But, you know, to me, it was like, 
that's why I wanted to be a doctor. I mean, I I always was intrigued to help people for certain, obviously, but you know how I wound up in my path. But a lot of my life was about pleasing other people and getting other people's approval versus doing what felt good to me. And of course, there's priorities. Like my son went to camp this morning. I got to pack his lunch. You know what I mean? Is that all about me? No. But I tried it in that moment, like feel good about what I'm making him and move slowly and make my tea first and drink that while I'm doing it and listen to a song I like. And, you know, like get in my groove and then act from that place. And We all have busy lives and schedules and things on our to-do list that need to get done, but to come from a place of inspired action, if you will, like, and how in this am I supporting myself, like to start to see that, that piece of it, it really does tame, you know, just basically it tames the stress hormones in our body, which are out to kill us, no joke, you know, stress creates an incredible amount of inflammation, which will kill cells in our our body and will set up the cascade for autoimmunity. So if we just sit back in those moments when the schedule feels really full and life is really busy and there's a lot on our to-do list, to breathe through them, to try to find things to appreciate while you're doing it, to tune into yourself, make sure you're still eating when you're super busy. You know, it's like all of these, there's just a bunch of little things, but how am I supporting myself while I'm going through my life? Right. Yeah. And I think it's very easy to get caught up on just the diet and the exercise and be like, oh, Mm -hmm. well, I'm eating my kale. I'm going to the gym, but I'm still Mm -hmm. not healthy. And I think it's that emotional piece that's really missing and that taking care of ourselves and putting ourselves first and realizing that that's not selfish or it's not bad to do that. It's like we have to do that in order to properly take care of ourselves so that we can take care of others as well. Exactly. Exactly. And it's a big piece that we're missing. I mean, I think about it too now being, you know, a wife and a mother, like I ran my businesses for 10 years before I met my husband and, you know, and then maybe 12 years before I had a child. And, you know, so my businesses and my books and all that were my babies. They were my life, right? And now I have these other people that are really important to me that, you know, the relationships are important to me. And so, I don't like to necessarily use the word balance, but it's just like, how do I find my groove with all of these things? And like, what makes my heart sing? I mean, that's the part that I try to sit back and reflect upon. I enjoy doing things like this. Like, I I love talking about women's health. I love reaching people. That inspires me. That makes me, you know, so it makes my heart sing. And so for all of us to get back in touch with those things, you know, like I'll see women that come into the clinic and especially if they're dealing with a pretty longstanding health issue or a fertility issue, it's the same, but their life has been put on hold. They stopped doing anything that they'd enjoy. They're eating the way they think they're supposed to eat because someone told them or they read some book, you know, maybe one of my books, but they're like resentful of it. Right. And and everything sucks because they're not getting what they want. And now they have to, you know, they can't eat gluten anymore and they have to, med- you know, and it's like all these things that they feel like they have to do versus, you know, shifting the perspective. It's not to say I don't want you to do those things, but could you do them from a place of, you know, I do feel better when I slow down and take care of myself. Like that does feel good. And to begin to just see it from that perspective rather than, checking the boxes. So it's getting more heart-centered. I think it's getting more in tune with our body, what we need, our truth, what we know to be our truths, you know, because we're really good at blocking those truths and disconnecting from our heart and just living in our mind and our brains and just going through the motions of things. Right. And another thing I think that's just important for people to know, like, especially if you're in a place where you feel like you are running yourself ragged and running yourself down and maybe not putting yourself first is that putting yourself first might look different for each of us, you know, and things that are going to help reduce our stress for one person, maybe it's meditation and yoga for another person, maybe it's a painting or an art class or cooking or singing or dancing, whatever the case may be. So to really try and find what your flavor is, what really makes you feel good. Yes. That's it. And it's just like a big student of Abraham Hicks. And and she'll say efforting versus inspired action. And that's not easy for all of us. But efforting means like, uh, I have to do this thing, you know, and I got to prepare for this meeting. And like, I push, 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 push versus stepping back and, okay, what excites me the most? 
you know, and it doesn't mean like, oh, it excites me the most to just sit on the beach and not have a job. Like, okay, that's a little unrealistic. So I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you also can't have that. And, and God bless you if you can. And that's your choice. But just this thing of like, okay, of these things on my plate, what excites me the most? Or how can I look at this project from a place that excites me? You know, even like making James's lunch this morning, you know, it's like, it excites me that I feed my kid good food, that I have the ability to buy organic. And, you know, and I got this cute little thing for him, this little lunchbox. And that excites me, you know what I mean? But if I was rushing through the moment, I would miss that moment of realizing like in this moment, I waited for a kid for a long time. I waited to have a family for a long time. And so like to remember, like now I'm a mom, I get to be a mom. I'm so lucky. And what a blessing this is. And I have a child that gets to go off to camp and, you know, to, to start to just like look at the small things and find in those moments, nuggets of appreciation, nuggets of excitement and get more into our heart. I think it's really, that's the key. Right. Sometimes it's just a matter of shifting your mindset and your perspective, being more grateful and looking at things from a place of gratitude versus that checking the box or I have to a chore. So I love that you said that. So let's talk about fertility because I know you are an expert on fertility. You wrote the book, You Can Get Pregnant Now and Into Your 40s. And I think that's a great title, especially since society would have us believe that our eggs are going to dry up at 30 and, you know, it's all downhill from there. So what should we know about getting pregnant and how can we maximize our fertility? I mean, it's really the same thing. So for me, right, I didn't have fertility challenges. I just had man challenges, right? I didn't meet the right guy till I was 39. I knew I wanted a family. I wanted babies as soon as possible. I probably efforted a lot of relationships rather than followed my heart in many of them because I was just trying to nail down the guy and and get married and have a baby. But what I did do was I practiced what I preached. And so, you know, my first book came out in 2009, Chill Out and Get Healthy, and it was just all about living a healthy lifestyle, right? And yes, you can get pregnant, same thing. Your fertility is an extension of your health on every level, mentally and emotionally, physically and nutritionally, you know, and I started my preconception plan, my preconception time frame, probably at about 35. And I know we don't all have that luxury to like go back in time, but to understand that fertility is an extension of health, period. So if there are health challenges that you are dealing with, whether it's in sleep issues or anxiety or depression or digestion issues, skin issues, hormonal issues, irregular periods, that stuff, you want to get that figured out. You want to live in a way that supports your body into like hormones being in balance, skin glowing, you feeling rested upon waking, you managing your stress, you finding more joy in your life, you know, right here and right now, not when. And treating your body like a palace, nourishing it, supporting it, and understanding that when you do that, you should be able to get pregnant all the way up to like, I think, 44, 45. What's happening in our society right now is the same, you know, trend that we were talking about earlier is women are not taking good care of themselves on any level. And we're taking good care of ourselves superficially. So we're wearing the right clothes and we're skinny enough. And I put that in air quotes, right? And, you know, maybe we're doing our green juice or something like that, but that it's so much more than that, you know, and green juice doesn't work for everybody, right? So finding what works for you is really important. And too much exercise or being too skinny isn't the right thing for you, right? Like, I was three or five pounds heavier than I wanted to be when I got pregnant. And then it made me realize that was probably my fertile weight. I was always a bit too skinny for a kind of a long time. And things had to shift in my body and eating enough fat and enough protein and enough vegetables was really what my body needed to be totally hormonally in sync. And everything came together. But the health of every single cell in your body is important. And the cells in your ovaries that make those eggs that your doctors tell you are dried up and old by the time you're 35 can be improved, right? You can improve the quality of every single cell in your body. You can quote unquote, fight the aging process or support. I like the word support better, but support the aging process. And you can improve the quality of those eggs. You can improve the quality of the blood flow in your body, the quality of your fertility, the quality of every single tissue and organ in your body. So to understand that it's time isn't running out and there isn't some big clock ticking and that every woman at 35, if you don't have kids, you're basically screwed. That's 
it's a fear mongering position and one that really stresses us out and will age us before our time and will cause a lot of inflammation, emotional inflammation in our body, which will affect our fertility. So to begin to just like remember, like in your heart of hearts, what do you believe? For me, I always knew I was going to meet my guy and I always knew I was going to have a family. And it took longer than I wanted it to, right? And you know, I wanted it at 30 and I had it at 39, right? So the timing, but you know, as uh, Gabrielle Bernstein, she's one of my best friends. She said to me one day, she said, uh, it's because God wanted you to write this book. Yes, you can get pregnant at 38, you know, and then go and show everyone. Yes, you can get pregnant at 40, you know, to trust the timing of things too, but to stay in your heart and know that everything you want is coming and perfectly unfolding. And your job is to just support and nourish yourself as best you can and live, you know, I think from a more heart centered space versus this heavy mind driven space where, you know, you have to check all these boxes and things have to be on a certain timeline. And if they're not, that you've done something wrong and you've screwed it up and to, to just really tune in and I mean, I guess the ultimate answer is your your fertility is an extension of your health. So you've got to treasure your health and you've got to treasure the beautiful vessel that your body is. Right. I love that you keep bringing it back to your fertility is not just your fertility. It's your overall health. And you can improve not only your eggs, but every single cell in your body. So it's just a great reminder that everything's connected. And again, I really love that traditional Chinese medicine is built on that belief that everything is connected and it doesn't operate separately. Like there's no GI doctor or, you know, an endocrine doctor. It's one doctor that deals with all of the systems. So in terms of fertility and then and traditional Chinese medicine, I know acupuncture is sometimes used as well. So I personally have done acupuncture in the past and found it very effective. Like the first time I went was in college and I was having my period disappeared for some reason, actually probably because I lost so much weight and was, was right. too skinny. And so I somehow ended up at a traditional Chinese medicine doctor and acupuncturist. And I remember walking into the office the first time with my mom and kind of being like, oh, I don't know what to expect. I hate needles. And the woman walking out, she had seen him before, before me, she was walking out of the office. And she's like, I don't know how this works, but it works. And I just remember so vividly this woman saying that. So I'm like, okay, I go in, I do a couple treatments over a short period of time. He also gave me a few herbs. And within a very short period of time, my period came back. And I was like, Oh, my God, this is amazing. How does this work? So right. for someone who is not familiar with acupuncture and hasn't done it before, how exactly does acupuncture work? And why is it something Thing maybe we should consider using? You know, I always say acupuncture aggravates the body to function better. So I take my little needles and I stick them in certain points that I think are either blocked or need more attention, you know, certain parts of the body. And it kind of wakes things up. You know, we say that all disease or disease in the body is a function of chi not flowing properly. So chi, aka like our vital energy, gets stuck somewhere in our body. Acupuncture is meant to open up the flow of things. So like in your case, you know, yeah, you probably maybe you lost too much weight. So there wasn't enough body fat, right? But there could have also been like a stress related situation that caused that weight loss or whatever it was. And what we need to do is like unblock those areas that got blocked. And then support you with some Chinese herbs and, you know, nourish your blood is typically what we'd be doing in a case like yours. And then it allows the body to feel supported enough to then do the proper job. You know, like a menstrual cycle is a luxury. It really is. So is fertility. It's telling me there is an abundance of something to give up. Basically, your body's saying when it comes to pregnancy, your body's saying, yeah, I have the goods to carry another life. Like creating a human is a really big job. It's not a joke. Like it's, it requires a lot of ammunition, you know, it requires an abundance of materials. And so and so does the regular menstrual cycle. We see it in Chinese medicine as there's an abundance of blood that I can give up every month. And when I don't feel like I have enough, I'm not going to give it up. It's the first thing the body will cut down uh, physiologically because when it doesn't feel like it's got enough, it ne you need blood to survive. And so if you don't have enough, you're not going to have a period. 
So to kind of start to think of it like that, and and that's my favorite thing about Chinese medicine is we look at like the resources. So how do we how do we manage the resources in the body? And you know, with acupuncture, it's still we do this intensive intake, right? And I'm like a detective. I ask about all the systems from like sleep to poop to stress management to what you're eating and what you're drinking and you know, your sex drive, your cognition, you know, all of these things. And that helps me put together a little picture of what I think is going on in your body. And then I I decide what organ systems might be out of whack. In Chinese medicine, you know, we have the same organs that we have in traditional medicine, you know, like the heart and the liver and the spleen. But these organs also have pathways throughout the body. And that's where the acupuncture points lie. They're called meridians, right? And so, you know, if I did an intake on you and I said, oh, I think her heart and her liver are deficient in blood, right? So then I would feel her pulses and I would maybe feel the same thing. And the pulses give me, you know, there's like 28 different pulse qualities and, and I get to feel what each organ is kind of telling me. It's fairly intuitive as well, but you can, you literally feel how much blood or energy is pumping through the vessel at that spot. And that gives me an idea of how the organ is functioning. And then I choose my needles based on that whole picture, right? I look at your tongue. The tongue is the only organ we say that we can see. So that tells me a lot. Like if it's pale, there's not enough blood. If it's dark purple, there's, it's blood stagnation. If it's really moist and wet, there's probably a digestive issue. If it's really puffy, you know, um, uh, you know, maybe we're overthinking or another digestive issue. If there's a really thick coating, again, digestion, um, if it's really thin and cracked, there's like dehydration, right? So there's all these things that we look at and we put all those pieces together and then we pick acupuncture points based on that. And that should work, right? It should then support the body to say, oh, okay, the heart and the liver need more energy. Okay. So we're going to redirect, you know, or, or we're going to unblock this to then get the flow back to the heart, right? Because sometimes it's that. And then, you know, acupuncture can't necessarily add substance to the body. Then that's where the diet comes in. That's where the herbs come in. And that's where the lifestyle comes in. So that was always my favorite thing is that, you know, acupuncture is just one of my tools, right? You know, another huge part of my, my you know, toolbox is, is the diet and, and the Chinese herbs. And, you know, if I can get someone to clean up their diet and eat in a way that really supports their body the acupuncture works so much faster. And then I put them on herbs and the herbs can get absorbed quickly, right? So it's like it all comes together to really bring back homeostasis and balance to the body. And so it's so interesting that you talked about looking at the tongue and taking the pulse as two of the main diagnostic techniques that you have in, in traditional Chinese medicine. Do you also look at blood work or is it? Yeah. So, yeah, of course. As I've evolved for certain as a practitioner and also with my Western background, I, I love to look at blood work and I recommend certain labs that need to get done just so I can understand more because I, I know so much more about the proper way to support diet and, and with certain supplements, if, you know, if there's like a vitamin D deficiency or if there's a thyroid condition and, you know, um, and even with fertility, like to understand what the hormones are doing and why I love the Dutch test. It's a urine test that you can use to, to look at hormones. So I do that a lot with my clients. Um, we'll even use the 23 and me, the, the genetics testing so I can see how their body is, is doing certain things or what their predispositions are. And then, yeah, just standard blood work, of course. So I'll, you know, often clients come to me with all of their labs. And if not, I recommend certain things to get done so that then it helps me, just helps me better treat. Right. Just having a multi-pronged approach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So before we wrap up, I know your most recent book is more focused on autoimmunity and it's called Body Belief, How to Heal Autoimmunity, Radically Shift Your Health and Love Your Body More. You mentioned earlier that a lot of times women have autoimmune conditions and they don't even realize that they have them. So maybe what are some of the most common autoimmune conditions that you see and what are some signs that we should go to the doctor and get these things checked? I mean, I think the most common one is Hashimoto's, which is um, a thyroid autoimmune condition. Uh, most women know about hypothyroidism, right, when the thyroid is under-functioning. But what we don't realize is that 90% of hypothyroid is actually Hashimoto. So it just means you have antibodies to your own thyroid, and your body begins attacking the thyroid gland, compromises its function, your thyroid gland then starts under-functioning, and you show signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism. 
um, which is like fatigue, brain fog, inability to lose weight, um, muscle aches and pains, irregular period, um, you know, difficulty concentrating, you're catching colds all the time. And all of those symptoms I just mentioned are basically the most common autoimmune condition symptoms. So other autoimmune conditions are things like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, celiac sprue. So that that could explain, that explains a lot of women. In fact, up, up at Yale Reproductive Medicine, they screen every single patient now for celiac and for Hashimoto's because they are the two most common causes of fertility challenges that are often overlooked. Um, I interviewed the Dr. Taylor who runs Yale Reproductive Medicine for for Yes, You Can Get Pregnant. And I told him, you know, my my because that was when the theory started brewing about body belief was like, I was like, don't you think that all these girls just have a, an autoimmune condition? And he said, you're, you're spot on young lady. He said, we're screening everyone now for celiac and Hashi's because he said, those are the two most common conditions we see happening concurrently with fertility challenges because they're often mistreated, right? So the celiac girls are still eating gluten. Hashimoto girls are still eating gluten and in both cases you can't eat gluten and typically dairy. Um, but so you know, so there's there's like some odd, some odd, a hundred and some odd number of um, autoimmune conditions, things like lupus, you know, um, Crohn's, colitis, you know, so any digestive disorder, you're falling into autoimmunity, like multiple sclerosis, um, you know, there's, there's, there's so many different ones, but often the autoimmune clients are the ones that have seen doctor after doctor after doctor and they still aren't feeling well. All their labs typically look quote unquote normal and none of their symptoms are changing. And in fact, they're getting worse and they just feel really tired every day. They're getting sick all the time. You know, their hormones are out of balance. They're just, um, you know, brain fog, body aches and pains, you know, and then maybe they're having fertility challenges or they've had more than one miscarriage. That's another really clear cut sign of an autoimmune condition. If there's more than one miscarriage, um, and that really, go ahead. And what's interesting is a lot of the symptoms that you're saying, the brain fog, the the aches and things like that, these are things that are also very often written off. Like, oh, you're crazy or, oh, you're probably fine. Like, it's nothing. There's nothing in the blood work, right? Yeah. So they say the average autoimmune patient sees a, a total of, I think, I forget the quote, five doctors over, 12 doctors over a five-year period. Um, before they get a diagnosis. And most often in their chart, at some point, a doctor has written that it's like psychosomatic. It's all in their head, basically. Um, and, you know, they just need to manage their stress better or sleep more or, you know, they don't believe them when they say, you really feel fine? And they're like, yeah, I do, you know. Uh, or no, I don't. You know, are you really sleeping enough? Yeah, I, I am. And you still feel exhausted all day? Yeah, you know. And so that's typically like that's the autoimmune picture. So for any of you that have been on a quest to to get healthier and nothing's really falling into place, you need to see you know someone like me, um, a functional medicine doctor. You know, read my book Body Belief. You know, because I give you a really clear cut plan, but. Uh, to understand that it's like a systemic inflammation that really needs to be managed and then the body will begin to calm down and the the autoimmunity unfortunately won't go away but it can be managed so that health can get restored right and are there any specific tests people could ask for is it more like just go to a functional medicine doctor or someone like you a traditional chinese medicine doctor and you can recommend specific tests for that person? Or it's like, if someone's really struggling, how do they finally get that diagnosis? I think you have to get to an endocrinologist. You know, that's probably the real key. You know, get your thyroid looked at, make sure they're checking thyroid antibodies. You know, then there's other things that detect inflammation in the body, like it's called the ANA, anti-nuclear antibodies, CRP, C-reactive protein. You know, you get your vitamin D checked. You make sure you might find out that you have the MTHFR mutation. So there's a bunch of different tests. I do list them all in the book. Great. And, you know, I think a functional medicine doctor is typically one of the best starting points. They're typically not inexpensive, however, can make all the difference. Right. Yeah. It's your health, right? It's yeah. it's, it's yeah. important. So yeah, it is unfortunate that functional medicine doctors, integrative medicine doctors can be a little pricey and are typically not covered by insurance. But if you're going to get that relief and feel good again, then it's worth it. Yes. So one last question. 
If there's one tip or piece of advice that you could give our listeners for how to live a happier and healthier life, what would that be? Slow down. (laughs) Spend time reconnecting with yourself and tuning into what are your true desires, what makes you excited, what lights you up and inspires you, and try to stay connected to that as much as you can. I love that. That's a great tip. Well, thank you so much for being here, Amy. And if anyone is based in New York and is having fertility issues or autoimmune issues, I do highly recommend you go see Amy. I know she's gotten a few of my friends pregnant who are having (laughs) fertility issues. So definitely go check her out. And where can we find you online? AmyRalph.com. You can also find me on Instagram at AmyRalph and on Facebook at AmyRalph. MSLAC or Body Belief Expert, either one on Facebook. I do weekly Facebook Live. On Instagram, I'm always sharing some tips of some sort. So, you know, I love those two social media outlets. And then on my website, you know, we're always doing blog posts and and things of that nature as well. Yes. And I'll link to all of those places in the show notes page. Definitely go check out her books as well. Amy is a serious wealth of knowledge. So thank you again for sharing your wisdom today. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in this week. If you enjoyed and got value from this episode, I'd be so, so grateful if you can take just one minute to leave an honest review on iTunes, as that will help us reach more people and get incredible guests on the show. To say thank you, email a screenshot of your review to info at mariamarlo.com and we'll send you a free three-day healthy eating sugar detox meal plan. After each and every episode, I encourage you to come say hi on Instagram at Maria Marlowe, that's M-A-R-I-A-M-A-R-L-O-W-E, or in the private Happier and Healthier podcast group on Facebook. In both of these places, we can continue the conversation about today's episode, so come and share what you think. If you want more, you can also head to mariamarlo.com where you'll find tons of healthy recipes, meal plans, and resources to help you live your healthiest and happiest life. Lastly, if there's someone you know who'd enjoy this podcast, make their day and mine and send it to them now. Until next time, don't forget, health and happiness are a choice. Our thoughts become our reality, so make sure you're thinking up a masterpiece.